A while back, I wrote a blog post about the enigmatic composer Eric Satie. In revisiting the post, there were additional details that I discovered since that are fascinating, at least to me, which I thought would now make an interesting video. The blog post originated with the study of Satie's pieces called the Nocien, which are playing in the background. They sound like a set of easy to play composition for piano beginners, but not quite so. These delicate pieces are haunting and quite captivating due to their very simplicity and require a master touch to bring out all their nuances. I love listening to them. They are my favorite pieces among his compositions. I first became acquainted with Satie and his compositions during my music student days and not because his work was featured in the courses, which unfortunately they were not, but because of my other obsession with French author Gaston Leroux's famous work, The Phantom of the Opera, which was first published as a newspaper serial in Les Galois in 1910, and later published in 1911 as a novel. In Leroux's classic tale of the deformed angel of music, taking up his abode in the labyrinthine cellars of the Palais Garnier, or as is commonly known, the former Paris Opera House, the hidden mass genius is a great eccentric. Among his various talents, he plays the organ, composes masses, and continually contemplates the inevitability of one's own death and the four last things, that is, death, judgment, hell, and heaven, by turning his bedchamber into a great memento mori, taking his nightly repose in an open coffin, surrounded by copies of the medieval chants, the Dies Irae, from the Latin Mass of the Dead. There is even slight evidence in LaRue's story that the Phantom has read that monumental spiritual classic, The Imitation of Christ, by Thomas A. Kempis. This displays a surprising element of contemplative reflection, even deep Catholic piety, from a character portrayed most of the time as a maniacal monster. But then, the author LaRue was a Catholic who obviously struggled with his own inner demons. Leroux was apparently proud of his French monarchical past, even claiming he was a descendant of the Norman King William the Conqueror and became a friend of Prince Philippe, Count of Paris. Yet, in his youth, Leroux was lured in by the laissez-faire bohemian lifestyle of Paris after his father's death, to where he quickly dissipated his whole inheritance in just a few months. And later in life, he even took a mistress. I've also read that he was fascinated with pagan mysticism to the point it became an embarrassment for his family. His obsession with the concept of reincarnation, to be precise. This certainly comes across in a few of his other works. We see this interest with Eastern cultures blending with his character of the Phantom, the masked genius having once been a world traveler like Leroux the journalist. The story hinting the Phantom experienced some interesting if albeit dark and murderous episodes, with the thieving strangler death cult of the Thuggies while journeying through India, and also while acting as both entertainer and executioner while in service to the Shah of Persia. The Phantom apparently attempts to make amends for his atrocities upon his return home by also returning to the Catholic faith in his own strange way as mentioned before turning his bedchamber in the depths of the opera house into a gothic memento mori. Researching the Rue story is when I discovered the composer Eric Satie for the first time and could not help but notice the similarities between him and the Phantom. Both are French and bear the same first name, including the spelling. Eric Satie was born in Montfleur, which is not that far from Rouen. Eric the Phantom is described as having been born in a village outside of Rouen. They are Catholic, have a deep mystical side to them, and share the same Gothic eccentricities. 
For instance, Eric the Phantom and Eric Satie, the composer, had the notion to write their music in red ink. Of course, as a Phantom fan and music student, I could not and still cannot help but wonder if the composer must have actually influenced the Rue in some way when he began to pen his famous tale. He was contemporary with the Rue, after all. Eric Satie would write scathing letters against his music critics, and Eric the Phantom also sends out demanding notes and dares to include his own articles into the Opera House legal contracts. In fact, Siti once challenged one of the joint managers of the Paris Opera to a duel when he received no reply after sending him one of his manuscripts, the Ballet Usbud, composed in 1892. He took the silence as a personal insult and was not about to let it pass. The joint manager at the time was Eugène Bertin, and he would later work with Pedro Gayard, the other joint manager from whom LaRue claimed he received much of his information regarding the management of the opera house when researching his novel. Surprise, surprise, just like Eric Satie, the Phantom also declares war on the opera managers when his musical demands are not met. I also found out Eric Satie had rigged up one of his apartments to where it had to be opened with a secret system with tripwires and Satie refused to allow anyone inside his apartment near the end of his life. In comparison, the Phantom is a master of secret passageways and known as the Trap Door Lover, and his secret home, situated by an underground lake, is guarded by an inventive, albeit deadly security system known as the Siren. While Satie's not-so-deadly tripwires may have been set up after LaRue's novel was published, it certainly is interesting how the connection continued. Of course, I had to find out more. Satie, although he's arguably not as famous as the composer Claude Debussy, who he became friends with and influenced greatly, and who influenced him, is famous as one of the father composers of Impressionist music, and also a composer during the French Symboliste movement. His avant-garde harmonies are capturing the attention of more people these days. His work definitely caught the attention of another composer friend, Igor Stravinsky, who describes Satie as, quote, the most rare and consistently witty person he had ever known. Satie definitely was eccentric. At one point he got the notion to eat only white foods, although whether he actually did or not is up for debate. Could be very touchy about his art. When a critic accused his music of having no shape or form, he exacted his revenge by composing music with the whimsical title, Three Pieces in the Shape of a Pear. He is also noted for having created the first ambient music, composing works intended to be played in the background and to be practically ignored. He even grew angry when people attempted to pay attention to or tried to study the compositional form of his ambient creations, which he literally called furniture music. Similar to LaRue's Phantom, Eric Satie had also fallen deeply in love, and only once. His one deep brush with romance occurred with Suzanne Valadon, who had been a model for the painters Toulouse-Lautrec and Renoir. She herself became a successful painter in her own right. They met in January of 1893, and their affair lasted five months. Despite seeing each other for this length of time, they only spent one night of passion together, after which Satie asked her to marry him. 
and she flatly refused. After which Sati wrote this rupture had left him, flooded by an icy loneliness that fills the head with emptiness and the heart with sadness. He spent the rest of his life a single man. Numerous letters he wrote to Valadon were found among his personal effects after his death, letters that he'd never had the courage to send her. I could not help but be interested in the fellow. Despite his eccentricities, it is interesting to see Catholics like Satie making a mark in the creative world, and then I discovered some other strange things that were disturbing. But then again, very similar to the polarity in the life of Gaston Larue, literary father of Eric the Phantom. Eric Satie was a friend of the Catholic literary art critic Josephine Peladon, who was also a believer in occult Martinism, and as such was deeply interested in dubious esoteric mysticism. Peladon therefore dabbled in what could be considered the white occult, the search for hidden knowledge and wisdom in ancient texts and symbols, such as in alchemy, Kabbalah, the Far East, and also Gnosticism. In 1888, Belladon founded a Rosicrucian order with Gerard Encloisé, a Spanish-born French physician and occultist, who had written books on magic, Kabbalah, and tarot card divination. In the 1890s, Belladon fell out with those with whom he founded his Rosicrucian order, and was started a Catholic Rosicrucian order called the Order du Temple de la Rose Croix, that functioned as an outlet for his beliefs regarding idealism and spiritualism in the arts. Although having a structure centered around squires, knights, and commanders, it was not intended primarily as a secret order like the Freemasons or the Rosicrucians. It was a quasi-mystical clique and held salons, gatherings for artists and musicians. In fact, one of the foremost rules of this salon clique was that its ideals were to remain firmly planted in Catholicism, but there is evidence Kabbalistic and Gnostic mysticism was also involved. Peladon believes that art, when encoded with spiritual messages and symbols, could act as a means to awaken the general public to spiritual ascent, and wrote a manifesto for the Rose Croix on this subject. Eric Satie was not simply one of the musician members of the Rose Croix Salon, but its official composer. It is thought Satie's exploration of Gnosticism with the Rose Croix was the prime source of inspiration for the Gnosticians, a term which he in fact coined as a distinct form of musical composition for the first time. A year after Gnosticism had been re-established circa 1890, Satie was introduced by Peladon to the Rose Croix, and the first three Gnosticians were composed around 1890 and first published in 1893. Also. The first salon held by the Rose Croix in 1892 performed a play by Peladon entitled Les Fils des Etoiles, The Son of the Stars, the plot featuring a shepherd who is inducted into the mystic priesthood of ancient Chaldea, famed for its knowledge of astronomy and astrology, to which Satie composed incidental music. According to Satie himself, the score for the first act contains a Nocien, Therefore, this music is sometimes referred to as the Seventh Gnosian. In all, the suggestion that an interest in Gnosticism during his involvement with the Rose Croix as the main source of inspiration for the Gnosians is not without foundation. However, information printed in various versions of the score claim that the word derives from the Cretan Gnosos, supporting the theory linking the Gnosians to the ancient myth of the terrified Minotaur and the labyrinth holding the monster captive. Several archaeological sites connected to the myth of the inescapable maze were famously excavated around the time that Satie composed these pieces, even though the first excavations of the site occurred in the 1870s. Perhaps, I may suggest, the Gnosians were influenced by both. The simple, haunting melodies bear all the hallmarks of a wandering soul lost in a dark, profound, spiritual and emotional labyrinth, the composer trying to find answers that seem to slip beyond his grasp at each turn, while barely hanging on to some vestige of truth, the original solo piano score having a thread-like structure and flowing free time, no bars or time signature, a form suggestive of his interest in medieval plainchant, 
while the dynamic directions of the score seem to plumb the deep depths of introspection with mysterious phrases such as interrogate, from the end of thought, postulate in yourself, step by step. Again, a strange connection to the Rue's masked phantom dwelling in the mysterious black maze-like depths of the opera house that once was used as a prison. The inevitability of death placed before his eyes through the repetition of the medieval plain chants of the Dies Irae on his bedchamber walls. Eventually, Satie parted ways with Paladin and the Rose Croix Salons when they did not see eye to eye regarding the arts and mysticism. And so, Eric founded his own church in 1893, the Metropolitan Church of Art of Jesus Conductor, of which he was high priest, treasurer, chapel master, and its only member. Satie adopted Gothic style apparel similar to dark monastic robes and assumed the unctuous manners of a priest, also calling his humble dwelling Abacol that is, having an atmosphere like an abbey or monastery. According to him, his aim was to create a refuge where Catholicism and the arts that are inextricably linked to it will grow and prosper under the shelter of any and all profanation. Also, this gothic artistic phase in his life occurred around the time with his relationship with Valadon. He was already struggling to find peace during this time with her as he wrote a composition entitled Gothic Dances, which he described on the title page to be a musical novena of prayer, quote, for the greatest calm and strong tranquility of my soul. So no doubt, his sorrow after Valadon's rejection only magnified his eccentric side during his attempt to seek solace for life's griefs in an orthodox, quasi-Catholic mysticism. We certainly see this in the development of his only large-scale liturgical work during his monastic period, when he styled himself leader of his own artistic church, that is, the Mass of the Poor, the composition of which occurred in 1893 through 1895. It was originally entitled The Great Mass of the Metropolitan Church of Art, and no doubt intended to be the signature piece of his church. Academic authorities on Satie's music have proposed the idea for the Mass itself came to mind after Valadon's rejection, which left him utterly devastated. For he completed the first movement of this work in late 1893 after she left him, which he titled Prayer for the Salvation of My Soul. How the Mass received the new title, Mass of the Poor, is unknown. There is no mention of, or reference to, destitute people suffering poverty in the text itself. So it is usually assumed the word poor, even though used in the plural, is in reference to the composer himself, who for his whole life lived in poverty, a poor rejected wretch left agonizing over his troubled soul. Again, a strange, coincidental, after-the-fact connection with the Rue's Phantom of the Paris Opera when considering that Satie's Mass of the Poor, the signature piece of his artistic church, was never performed and not rediscovered until after his death, which was 14 years after the Rue's story was published as a novel in 1911. The Gloria section of the Mass of the Poor was not found after Satie's death. It is considered lost, a peculiar twist of fate almost turning his mass into the sung masses of the penitential periods of the Catholic Church when the glory is not sung, which also includes the somber time of a funeral. In comparison, 
Eric the Opera Ghost is also shown to be an isolated, priest-like character, singing masses of the dead for his victims, which bears the hallmarks of a soul suffering some form of great remorse. LaRue's Phantom also composes a nuptial mass and a funeral mass. It can be assumed he composed the nuptial mass in the hope the love of his life would willingly choose him, for why else would he compose such a mass? But he learns true love cannot be forced, and true love means sacrifice. In the end, the opera ghost dies of a broken heart, having allowed the love of his life go free to marry the man whom she truly loves. It seems the Phantom, therefore, had composed his own funeral mass. LaRue himself exclaims, Poor unhappy Eric. Returning to Eric Satie, although devastated, he did not die of a broken heart. Instead, things seem to have taken a more bitter turn. Two years after his breakup with Valadon, in 1895 he abandoned his church, the priest-like robes giving way to the flannel suit, umbrella, and bowler hat of his velvet gentleman period, which remained his personal style to the end of his days. He also finally gave up the Rose Croix musical style in 1900, regarding the former religious side of his composition technique as music on its knees. Furthermore, the piano playing bohemian of the Montmartre cafes became a socialist, then embraced communism in 1921, having been seduced by Lenin's speeches. Regarding his other inner demons, he forever suffered from the grip of one particular affliction, alcohol, and his personal favorite poison was absinthe, the green fairy, or rather one could say, the enticing emerald devil of the Belle Epoque days of Paris. In January of 1925, Satie fell gravely ill with pleurisy brought on by cirrhosis of the liver, and on February 15th was admitted to St. Joseph's Hospital in the Rue Pierre La Rousse. He passed away on July 1st of that year at the age of 59. Considering all of this, sometimes I cannot help but wonder where the souls of the famous end up for eternity. So many people in the creative spheres have given much to the world with their great talents, only to be dragged down dark, twisting paths while in their continuous search for beauty and truth. The various tantalizing snares of the world having them seek truth, love and beauty in all the wrong ways and places. Yes, the eccentric and the creative souls in particular seem to be easily enticed and led away by the false promises and worthless glitter of this mortal life dangled before them. At least Eric, the mass genius of the opera house, is given his chance of redemption. LaRue, who continued to claim that the opera ghost was indeed real long after his story was published, had pity on the man isolated in the depths of the cellar and prayed for his soul according to the epilogue of the novel. One cannot help but wonder what became of Satie the composer, who apparently inspired the fictional side of the Phantom. Then I discovered this. Satie's few close Catholic friends also worried for him, in particular Jacques Maritain, the celebrated philosopher and professor at the Catholic University of Paris. He was also the French ambassador to the Holy See, and is famous for his influence in the development and drafting of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Maritain was among the friends who came to see him the first day he was admitted into the hospital. 
it was immediately obvious to them that Satie was not going to leave the place. However, the composer himself did not know it, or was in denial his end was approaching. His temper was getting the better of him because of his illness, according to his other friends, the composer Darius Milaud, who wrote, He had never been ill before, and everything gave rise to dramas, from taking medicine to having his temperature read. And, according to Milhaud, was likely to fly into inexplicable rages if things were not placed exactly the way he wanted them in his suitcase. Apparently, Satie was gently urged to make his peace with heaven by Marathon, but Satie remarked that once he got better and was out of the hospital, he would then amend his life, but declared, not too suddenly, as that would upset his friends. No doubt, he meant the other bohemian free livers he hung out with. Considering his drinking, his formal dabbling with the cult and heretical offshoot mysticism before turning to socialism and communism, no wonder Satie's Catholic friends were worried for him. As it looked like he may not be long for this world, they were also deeply concerned he was delaying to complete his Easter duty before the season passed. That is, confession and communion once a year during the Easter period, practically the absolute minimum the Catholic Church requires of those professing to be its members if they hope to attain salvation. The fact he was delaying something so important suggested he had not been attending the sacraments regularly either. However, there was some hope he had not truly lost the faith as Eric held up a crucifix he carried, saying his only hope was in this one. But he was still in denial of his approaching end, and not accomplishing his Easter duty, a dangerous thing to do. A thought then struck Maritain. If they couldn't get the touchy, short-fused artist to prepare properly for death, perhaps someone else could, and he had the perfect person in mind. He suggested to Satie that he should see the parish priest of the Reich Pickers. He just might like him. And lo and behold, the composer consented. Seizing this opportunity, Maritain bolted out of the room to fetch the priest. His departure was so swift, Eric remarked, He goes fast, does Maritain. Who was the parish priest of the Reich Pickers? None other than the mystic Pierre Lame, gifted with the discernment of souls, prophecy, and who also received numerous visits from Our Lady and the angels. He also saw the devil numerous times, and once witnessed a battle of wills and words between Satan and the Queen of Heaven. The Archbishop of Paris once said with grateful admiration that they had another saintly curé of ours in their midst. If anyone could reach Eric's soul, it would be Pierre Lame. But... They had to handle this carefully. As they drove to the hospital, Maritain tried to gently explain the situation to the humble, unassuming priest of the back streets. The composer was touchy and a great artiste. It was easy to upset him. Satie himself once declared, The musician is perhaps the most modest of animals, but he is also the proudest. Satie's friends knew this was probably their last and only chance to reach him, and they had to tread softly lest he shut them all out. As they entered Satie's room, the priest and the composer exchanged very polite greetings with interest and respect. But then, against all the quiet warnings tactfully imparted by Marathon, Pierre Lame launched into the most unexpected and banal conversation. They small talked about the rain and fine weather, health and sickness, then proceeded to share an absurd amount of old wives' tales regarding home remedies and quack nostrums. They even seemed to enter a friendly competition or one up on youth bantering to see who had the most bizarre cure-all for all different ailments. Imagine the scene. What? We're trying to save a soul here, and all you can talk about is that? Then, Satie made a passing reference to music. Ah, you're a musician, Pierre Lame inquired. Yes, a bit, Satie modestly replied. You conduct an orchestra? No, Satie replied, smiling into his sleeve. Then you give piano lessons. No. 
Ah, I see. Are you a master? Lemmy asked. Satie's friends were mortified with this musical turn in the conversation. To think the great artiste was not recognized by the priest, and to be taken as an obscure teacher, someone who could not compose or perform, and who therefore ended up giving lessons in some apartment. That's what the questions implied. Of course, Pierre Lame didn't know the man and was asking polite questions, but to suggest the composer was unknown was dangerous territory. Was Satie insulted? Maritain was certainly dismayed. It was as if the old priest had completely forgotten the warning he had given him, and thought by now all was lost. But then Pierre Lame changed. His jovial nature assumed a majestic bearing, and with regal gravity of tone he asked, Will you let me give you the benediction of the Blessed Virgin? The composer consented, and so the old priest slowly and solemnly gave him his blessing. As Pierre Lame left the room, he turned to Martin and noted, He is an honest man, a straight soul. This gave Martin hope. You will come back to see him again, father, he tentatively asked. No doubt Guy of all people would convince Eric to accept his fate and fulfill his Easter duty. Apparently, Pierre Lame could read his thoughts. There will be no need to. The chapel will do everything. As Pierre Lame foretold, the hospital chaplain found Satie quite willing to accept the spiritual help after that. When asked if he wished to make his Easter duty, Satie promptly declared, Yes, certainly. I am a Catholic. Before his death, he asked to receive communion two more times as well. It is said he remarked, It was the first time he had ever seen a saint in the flesh. The musician's reluctant heart had been touched by the benediction of the mystic to the great relief of his friends. And that's something they don't tell you about in the music books. Thank you for watching. If you liked this video, please give it a like, share, comment, and subscribe so you never miss another video. You never know what I may come up with. Thank you.